Welcome to the Authentic Self Revolution. I'm Carly, your guide on this journey to genuine living and the real wealth of freedom and fulfillment. In a world that just loves to tell us who we should be, we're here to remember who we truly are. We're here for the questioners, the misfits, and anyone who's ever felt there must be more to life than following the script. Together, we'll explore what it means to revolutionize your life by living it on your terms. Each week, we peel back the layers of shoulds and musts and dive into practical ways to live more authentically. If you're listening only and want to see my face, you can head over to my YouTube channel, Owning Authenticity, where you will find this podcast along with a treasure trove of other content aimed at uncovering who you truly are. Your authentic self is waiting. So let's dive in. This morning, I am just coming back from the cup filling experience of all cup filling experiences. Okay. So like, wow, wow. The energy is palpable. And I was like, what better way to use this energy than to hop on and record the next episode of the Authentic Self Revolution podcast, share this energy, share the wealth, the freedom and fulfillment, the, the literal soaring feeling, the the taking flight and flying feeling of sharing your gifts with another person who needs them in that moment. Okay. And today's episode, we're talking about five ways to recognize when you are suppressing the real you, meaning you're taking the real you and you're shoving it on down. Okay. Like, no, locking it in a basement somewhere. All right. And there are all kinds of reasons that we do that. And we've talked on multiple episodes so far about several of those reasons being rejection, trauma, fear of disappointing other people, fear of being cast out, fear of getting shut out of the tribe, on and on and on. There's all kinds of reasons why we hide or suppress who we really are. But this morning, oh, this is such a great, great jumping off point for this episode. This morning, I got to literally fly in my gifts and have it make a meaningful impact to someone that in that moment, the real me was exactly what they needed. Okay. And five years ago, hell, even like a year ago, I don't know if I could have sat with this person and delivered me in that same way. I mean, I know I couldn't, we're always standing on our leading edge, but to get to share my gift of holding space for people to feel better. That's essentially what the ultimate calling of my life is. And I do that through podcasts and videos and coaching sessions and in-person sessions, like what this morning was getting to hold space for people to feel better. As I sat there and was just sharing space with her, having a conversation with her for about an hour and watching the physical signs, hearing it in her voice and watching the physical signs of her body calm down. And then even the icing on the cake, hearing her say at the end, I feel so much better. I had no idea how helpful this was going to be. And it's like, yeah, what a, what a concept that just calming down is magic because we, we have so much inside of us and We are the expert of how to let us come out when we feel safe and calm to do that. And so this morning I got to see essentially like a payoff, like a culmination point of all of the healing work that I've invested in ending my patterns of self-suppression. And we're going to talk about what five of those patterns look like, but ending those patterns so that the real me can come online 
And today, this morning, really drove home for me, why do we do that? Why is that so important? What comes to mind for you? I'd love to hear in the comments. I'd love to hear, you know, respond to my email, post it on social media. Why is it so important to be the authentic you? And what I wish for every single person is to have a moment where their truest self is medicine to somebody else in the moment where that's the exact medicine they needed. You know, like your gifts, your truth, your authenticity is medicinal to somebody else. And not that that's necessarily why you do it, because your authenticity is also medicine for you, but the cup filling experience that it was to watch how, how my true self helped herself to feel better and to open up and to let more of her come out. I mean, the contagious nature of me being my real self that let her step more fully into that too. Like, it's just hard to even put into words like how freaking good that felt. So I, I love this. I love this story as far as, right, so what are the signs that we are stifling that medicine, right? The real you, the authentic you, like what are the signs that there's even more that could be coming out and that could be helping you to feel better and could be serving as medicine to other people who you probably already love and care about. So I want to go through five of these signs of self-suppression and as we go through each one i'm going to say if you're able to grab a piece of paper and rate yourself on a scale of one to five for each sign where one is like i don't relate to this at all i don't feel like this describes me at all and five meaning this describes me to a t very accurately okay and there's not a right or wrong answer. Nobody's going to collect the answers to the test. Okay. This is just data for us to be able to reflect on those responses and for you to be able to hone in on where is the biggest gain for how to unlock even more of who you really are, which of these areas and specific healing pathways would pay off most for you in this moment. And the other thing I want to say is that this is also designed, this assessment, to be something that you could revisit over time because chances are that the ones that you rate really high are the ones that you're ready to see right now, okay? And the ones that you rate really low, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have none of that going on, but what it does mean is that you're not ready to face it right now, and that's totally fine because there's plenty of meat on the bone of the ones that you are able and willing to see in this moment. So start there, right? This is that low-hanging fruit concept. We start where we are and work our way through what is right where we are, and as we heal that, As we go around the spiral, we'll come back around and find other ways to continue to unlock more and more and more of our of our true self to end even more of our self-suppression patterns. So sign number one is chronic people pleasing. Okay, and basically what that means is that you consistently prioritize others needs over your own. And that could be your friends or your children or your parents or your animals. I mean, the ways we will externalize our focus and care for others is pretty unlimited. Okay. And I have to tell a funny story about this (laughs) where... I am, I am a recovering people pleaser. I will absolutely admit to that. There's no shame whatsoever in stating where you are on your healing journey. And I still continue to work on this. 
Um, I have recently started working with an AI program called Claude.ai and was having a conversation back and forth with Claude to help me develop something I was working on. And basically what happened was the version that Claude drafted, I didn't like it so well. There were there were parts of it where like I don't I don't love the way that's phrased. And my initial instinct was to like make the best of it, to like just make it okay. Like like literally about an AI program. I was like, well, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to ask for too much. I don't want to hurt their feelings. This is artificial intelligence. It's not even freaking alive. Okay. And I'm worried about hurting the thing's feelings. And so actually working with Claude after I recognized, like, isn't that interesting? Working with Claude has actually been really good for me to kind of confront that instinct that has nothing to do with the other person. I am like thinking about the feelings of something that's not even alive. Okay. So that's me. That's not this other thing being demanding or anything like that or guilting me or anything. So some different ways that you might recognize, like if chronic people pleasing applies to you as far as rating it from one to five, you often say yes, even when you want to say no, you feel resentful after agreeing to do things for others, and you rarely express your own preferences or opinions in group settings. You just automatically go with what what the other person wants or the group wants. So go ahead and rate that one, one to five, of how much you recognize that one in yourself as a sign of self-suppression. And, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on healing these because we've kind of dealt with most of these individually on their own as far as how to overcome them. So for several of these, I recommend going back to some previous episodes. But like for this one, getting in touch with your authentic yes and your authentic no And being honest with yourself is absolutely step number one as far as how to overcome chronic people pleasing. So often we don't even know that like K-N-O-W, we don't even know that our answer is no and O until we feel resentful. And then it's very easy to put the blame on the other person when actually we said yes when we meant no. We just didn't even know that we meant no. You know what I mean? If you relate to that one, I'm guessing you do. The second sign, and this absolutely contributes to not really being able to even feel our yes or no. The second sign of emotional suppression is emotional numbness. Okay, so like really not feeling much of anything or not feeling anything. And this sign is is characterized as difficulty identifying or expressing your true feelings. So maybe you don't even know what they are. And like, if you're anything like me, like back in the day, I don't even know if I could have related to emotionally numb because I legit thought I had no emotions. So I don't even know if I could have made the leap to saying like, I have them, but I've numbed them. I thought I don't have any. And that is like a hundred percent emotionally numb. And so now I know that, but at the time, like I just, I didn't have capacity to understand that that's what was going on, but some different ways of how you might recognize this. You often feel fine or okay without much variation. Like when I ask somebody how they're doing and they say fine, that is like an instant like perking my ears up of like, oh, oh, you're you're fine. Okay. Like I I don't know if that's true and I'm guessing you don't either. You know, like no judgment, no shame, no offense, but like how are you is a pretty in-depth question when somebody is asking it who actually cares. Like I totally get how there are people asking that question all day, every day, and they don't, they don't give two shits about what the answer is. And so like, yeah, I'm fine. How are you? Like it's, it's kind of like a societal nicety. 
Um, but when I ask somebody, I want to know the answer. How are you? And so when somebody tells me they're fine, I say, oh, tell me more. You know, like, tell me more about your fineness. And then almost always, like, you'll find that there's some things that they're holding back, that they're shoving down, that they're suppressing their real self and they're, they're masking it with fineness. Um, another way to recognize this, you struggle to name specific emotions when asked how you feel, you know, like there are surveys that have been done where a large portion of the population can identify basically three emotions like happy, sad, and mad. And that's it. And actually there are hundreds of emotions. Like they all kind of boil down to maybe a basic list of about seven different emotions. But as far as the subtle variations, there are hundreds in the way that like nervous and scared, they're both basically fear, but obviously scared is a much stronger fear than nervous. Nervous is a much smaller fear. So That's how, when you really get into the subtle distinction of emotions, there are hundreds of different variations of ways that we feel. And if you can't recognize that, like that doesn't really mean anything other than there hasn't been a lot of practice doing that, like anything else, like it's a skill, emotional recognition, um, And so one way that I've built this inside of myself, right, coming out of like robot mode, um, I highly recommend the book by Brene Brown called Atlas of the Heart, where she doesn't go through hundreds. She's limited the number of emotions down to, I think, 87. And she defines 87 different emotions based on what causes them, how they feel in your body, the effect of that emotion, um, That's where I learned the difference between envy and jealousy. Like it's so freaking cool to see. And once you know the emotion, like once you can label the emotion, there's guidance in every single subtle distinction of how you feel like that's your turn by turn direction. So talk about like the value of like stopping the pattern of self-suppression, like becoming a numb you get access to your inner wisdom. You get access to all of this guidance that you maybe didn't have access to before. Um, And the last way you can recognize emotional numbness is if you experienced chronic physical symptoms like headaches or stomach issues or fainting or all kinds of things that have no apparent cause. And it's like our emotions are our body's way of whispering our guidance. And then physical health issues like body issues like gut pain or headaches or whatever it is, that's our body's way of shouting. So the more attuned we are to our emotions, those subtle clues to how we should be navigating through our moment to moment experience, the more we're attuned to that and listening to that, honoring that, the less need our body has to scream at us because we already heard the message. We already got the message. It's been delivered. The messenger can go on now. Just like if a messenger is standing at your door and they have to deliver their message, right? That guidance has to get through. The messenger's knocking politely, pleasantly. Those are your emotions. And then if you don't answer the door, the messenger is going to be pounding at the door. And that's the physical symptom that says, you will hear me. Okay, like there's no way around this guidance must be heard. And so the difference between those emotional messages and the physical symptoms that are messages, um, that's just one benefit of kind of tuning into that emotion and not keeping yourself numbed out to it. Um, The third sign, so rate yourself on that emotional numbness of one to five, how much that resonates and how much it doesn't for you right now. And number three sign of, of self-suppression is perfectionism and fear of failure. Okay. So perfectionism is kind of the opposite of authenticity where our authentic self is real and flawed period. Okay. So like that's, what's true about every single human being is that we have gifts and we have shortcomings. Okay. And 
I hesitate to even call them shortcomings because they're just the trade-off. Like when you're really good at one thing, you're naturally not going to be that great at its opposite. Like that's just kind of nature in general. And when we are suppressing ourself, we are essentially trying to hide those flaws. We're aiming for perfection. We're aiming for success on every single facet and as a way of overcompensating for the flaws that we haven't accepted about ourselves, the flaws, again, the shortcomings, like I use air quotes around all of these. And I relate to this one hardcore. I mean, really all of them, obviously, um, is where the list came from, but so perfectionism and fear of failure, what this is really saying is like, you're setting unrealistically high standards for yourself. And holding yourself accountable to these unrealistic standards and then most likely causing devastating effects on your mental health as a result of these unrealistic standards. The standard isn't real. And then you expect yourself to meet it like it is. And talk about setting yourself up for failure when really failure is the main fear, like driving that whole process. So that's why there's a whole episode on how to overcome perfectionism and the fear of getting it wrong. Um, One of the biggest ways that I would advise anyone relating to this is like, if you're afraid of failure, it pays to live inside the question for a while of like what success and failure even mean to really personalize your definition and your understanding of what is success? What does that mean to you? And that may not come super easily. You know, these unrealistic standards, oftentimes we blindly chase after them without ever really fully taking the time to question and understand and consciously commit to wanting that thing. This is where programming and cultural conditioning and like, it's just what you do kind of thing. And, you know, I do this because my dad did this or like whatever the case is. So taking some time to really understand for yourself, what does failure really mean? What does success really mean? You know, and some different ways to recognize this one as far as rating it for yourself. You procrastinate on tasks due to fear of not doing them perfectly. You put something off because I don't think I'm good enough yet, or I don't know enough yet, or whatever that story might sound like. Um, you're highly critical, self-critical, focusing on flaws rather than achievements. And in this one, you know, you may notice that, yeah, sometimes like I can be really, you know, my own cheerleader and like pumping myself up and proud of myself and other times not so much. You know, it kind of varies, especially if you're a woman, it varies throughout the month, (laughs) like right before, right before you start bleeding, like right before your period, like talk about perfectionist city, talk about self-critical city, right? Like take a detour through like the ghetto of your mind and good luck in there, right? Versus like when your energy's at its peak, like, yeah, it's a lot easier to feel good about yourself. Like that's just something to kind of pay attention to with, um, especially if you're a female, like with your cycle. Um, And the last thing is you avoid trying new things unless you're certain of success. So you don't really put yourself out there. You don't really take those risks. So go ahead and rate that one, one to five. And then number four is constant comparison to others. And with this one, I would also encourage you to say like comparison to others. Like again, maybe it's not constant. Maybe it comes and goes. Maybe there are certain kinds of people that you're more likely to compare yourself to than others. But comparison, there's so many different ways to say this, but like the one I love the most is comparison is the thief of joy. Okay. Like comparison and perfectionism, that's like oil and water with authenticity. Nobody else is you. Nobody else on this planet can tell you how to you. You are the expert on you from the inside out. So comparing yourself to anybody else, you just got to ask yourself why you're doing it. 
you know, because there are productive uses of comparison. And we can talk about that here in a second. And then there are unproductive uses. So like the kind that inspire and motivate you to rise and to be better, like a better you, not to copy and copy paste this other person, but like you see somebody else doing something that like they've proved it's possible. And now you want that for yourself. Like you want to, to incorporate that into who you are. Like, great. That's wonderful to like continue to evolve and aspire to new heights and like chase Mm. after, you know, the, the ultimate version of who you want to be in this life. Like all of that's great. Nobody's saying don't do that. But when you compare yourself to somebody and it makes you feel like a, like a sack of moldy beans, it ain't working. Okay. And the other problem with comparison is that we look at somebody's external self and we compare their external self to our internal self because we can't see anybody else's internal self unless they are really vulnerable and open hearted. Okay. So when somebody is putting on a front, you know, you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. You're comparing their external front, their facade, their curated mask to your internal shit show, maybe. And that doesn't mean that they don't have their own internal shit show. And that doesn't mean that somebody else wouldn't look at your mask and feel like you've got it all together. But on the inside, maybe you do or don't, depending on the moment. You know, like comparison is a slippery slope. And so it really pays to be mindful of what are you using it for? What's that information for? And so like basically we get into trouble when we start measuring your worth based on how you stack up against others. Like when you start detracting points from yourself because they've got this figured out or they've achieved this thing. And like you haven't, so now you feel bad about yourself again. Like that's, that's where it's really hurtful to do that to yourself. And some specific ways that you might recognize this is like when you check social media and then you feel inadequate afterwards, or you hang out with a group of friends and you feel inadequate afterwards, like that's, that's not super constructive behavior for yourself. And that doesn't mean you can't do it right? Like we all have free will. We can engage in whatever behavior we choose. But if you want to feel good about yourself, if you want to feel free and fulfilled, it pays to only compare yourself when it's going to help you to feel better about yourself or like you can do things that maybe you didn't previously know were possible because you're seeing somebody else who has you know, walked that path. And now you think you want to walk that path too. Like, again, that's great. Like we're, we're all in this together. We can help each other in that way. Um, another way to recognize comparison is that you adapt your behavior or appearance to match those around you. Like when you're comparing to be able to fit in, you know, like you're speaking as they speak and you're, you're dressing how they dress and you're laughing the way they laugh and like all the things Like, again, like if you feel like it's improving you and you feel better and better and better about yourself, awesome, awesome. Like, that's great. If it makes you feel worse about the real you, you're kind of going colder, colder, colder. Um, You feel envious of others' success rather than inspired. You know, that'd be the last way of recognizing that comparison of like, when you look at somebody else's success, is it lifting you up? Like, oh, wow, look what they did. Like if they did it, I could do it. Like, great. Like now I've got renewed spark of like going after my dreams. Or are you looking at them and like kind of beating yourself up because they already did it and you didn't. Those are two very different things. So go ahead and rate yourself on this one of cons- of comparison to others, one to five, how much that resonates with you. And then the last one is disconnection from your body. So ignoring or overriding your body's signals and needs. So self-suppression, your body is a huge part of self. Your body is also where your subconscious mind lives. Your body is also where your emotions live. And so basically when we suppress ourself, 
we stop paying attention to our body. We live in our head, you know, like, especially if you relate to any kind of like a hollow feeling inside of you, like a, like I I've, I've been told I've got a flair for the drama, um, but like a gnawing, aching void inside of you. If you've ever related to that, you may be disconnected from your body. And the reason I say that is because I absolutely lived with that void. It almost ate me alive a couple of times. That hollow feeling is very difficult to sustain long term. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until you don't even want to be here. And I've found that getting in my body has filled up that void that for a long time I tried to fill with food or alcohol or gold medals or like hitting goals or hitting financial goals or like buying my house or, you know, whatever it was like that next rung on the ladder that I was going to reach thinking that once I have that, then I'll feel whole and good about myself. And quite the opposite, actually, because at least when you're going after the goal, there's the pursuit and the pursuit is somewhat filling you up. And when you get the thing and the pursuit is over, you're actually more hollow than you were before. That's when you know that there is a disconnect between you and your body. And getting in your body is really just a matter of listening. Listening to what signs and signals your body is giving you. And so some ways to recognize, some additional ways to recognize that you're disconnected from your body is that you push through physical discomfort or fatigue regularly. All right, like you get the signal and you're like, I don't have time for that right now. I don't have time to slow down. I have so much to do. Um, You struggle with intuitive eating, either under eating or overeating. And I would would say the same for uh, like you get dehydrated regularly where you forget to drink water for long periods of time. And like there were times I remember like especially um, when I was opening my first business, the grocery store, where I would recognize that like I've been here doing this, running around, doing all the things for like 12 hours. I haven't gone to the bathroom since... I left home this morning, 12 hours ago. And how am I getting away with that? Oh, right. I haven't even touched my water bottle at all. And so like I'm getting the signals from my body that I'm low blood sugar, that I'm thirsty. And I am so in my head, so focused on my to-do list and the next thing I need to do and the phone is ringing and I need to do this and I need to make sure this and I need to write the check for this in my head 100% and my body is sending up all these signals and I'm not getting any of them. And the last one is you find it difficult to relax or sit still without feeling guilty. So when you start to just be guilt is like right there waiting for you. And if anything, you know, in order to hear your body, in order to reconnect with your body, we have to get still enough to listen. And this is why a lot of people who are intent on avoiding their emotions will stay busy no matter what. Stay busy to the point of like physically crashing because when you get still, you'll hear what's in your body. And that is beautiful guidance. Like there's all kinds of beautiful wisdom that lives in your body, but surfing the emotions that are in there is again, a skill that takes practice. So being still is a practice and starting small with like even setting your timer for 30 seconds and just closing your eyes and feeling into your body. What do you notice? You know, like if you're brand new to reconnecting with your body, 30 seconds is friggin' plenty. 15 seconds might even be plenty. 
All right, let alone 20 minutes of like, yeah, just meditate for 20 minutes. Yeah, good luck with that. Okay, <laughs> like it took me took me a lot of practice to work my way up to even five minutes, let alone 20. Okay, so no shame. Just notice where you are. So on a scale of one to five, how do you relate to being disconnected from your body? And then let's do some reflection questions before we wrap this up. Um, So which one of these signs of self-suppression resonated with you the most? Like as you look at your list, which of them resonated the most and why do you think that is? All right. And I'm going to invite you to pause the episode if you'd like to kind of spend some time with that. And we'll move on to the next question. Can you recall a recent situation where you exhibited one of these signs and how did it make you feel? Okay. Again, pause if you want more time. Number three, looking at your highest rated sign, what do you think you're afraid might happen? if you didn't suppress yourself in this way. Okay. Pause for more time. Number four, consider your lowest rated sign. What strategies or experiences have helped you avoid self-suppression in this area? Like, why do you think you're doing so well in that area? And is there something that you can take into some of these other areas that might help you suppress less in those areas? And last, go ahead and choose one sign you'd like to work on, right? One small step that you could take this week to suppress less in that area to be more authentic in that area. So this is just one more angle of looking in on how to be authentic, right? Like we can have conversation after conversation after conversation about why authenticity is so important. And if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're already sold on authenticity matters. But then how do you actually do it? Right. So these episodes are aiming to give you tangible steps, tangible awarenesses that you can grab a hold of and gather the data. Isn't that interesting? And then be with it. Right. Notice when it comes up and where it's more likely to come up and practice your breathing and practice your self-compassion and be gentle with yourself as you explore these patterns so that a little bit more authenticity can come online. And then a little bit more and a little bit more because every single small step towards more authenticity is absolutely a victory worth celebrating. Dear friend, it has been my pleasure to be with you during this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and participating in the self-assessment. I would love, 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 love to hear about your experience either in the comments or tag me on social media, hashtag authentic self-revolution. And if you're ready to go even deeper with some personalized attention and support, some space holding to help you feel better for a little bit more of your authenticity to come online, I encourage you to book the authenticity activation session, uh, the complimentary one-on-one session that I offer by visiting owningauthenticity.com slash activate. And next episode, we are going to dive into living our dream life right? Like really what is best case scenario when you let your full self come online is that you get to live your dreams. You essentially make your dreams come true. The dreams that live in your heart that maybe you think they're so far fetched, you haven't even admitted them out loud. Yeah. Those are the ones I'm talking about. Those suckers come true. Like the conversation I had this morning, that was a dream come true that five years ago, 10 years ago, like I barely wanted to stay on this planet, let alone thought that that was a reality that I could be living. And yet here I am and my authentic self knew how to walk right there. And that's possible for you too. So please tune back in for the next episode. Until next time, I do hope that you are taking such good care of the precious one that you are. And so will I.